Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. In our course video, Diving into Dynamic Range, someone asked what a camera with dual ISO, like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, does with dynamic range. Well, I dug around and noticed that the BMP CC4K's dual ISO sensor is actually a great demonstration of some of the fundamental principles outlined in my dynamic range video. If you haven't watched it yet, you should you should, you really should, along with our deep dive video into the science of exposure. Both of those videos provide the background for what we're going to discuss today. So let's get right into it. Let's recall what ISO is. Now, ISO is not the quantum sensitivity of the sensor itself. The sensor sensitivity is set at the point of manufacturing. A certain number of photons hit the silicon sensor and produce a certain number of microvolts of electricity. I get in the mechanics of this in my science of digital sensors video. But from this one single sensitivity, we send those microvolts into some micro circuits that amplify and create an analog signal, which is then sent into the analog digital converter and processed. We can change the sensitivity of the entire imaging system by changing how much gain we apply to signal both before and after the ADC. ISO is a standard rating for film speed. At any given ISO rating, a certain predetermined amount of light should return middle gray, regardless of the camera brand. Though there is a lot of wiggle room, but that's a, another topic altogether. So what's with this concept of dual ISO? Well, a sensor that has been given a lot of light presents noise differently than a sensor that's been given very little light. Some system designs incorporate alternative strategies for noise cancellation when the camera is engaged in high ISOs as opposed to low ISO settings. Let's diagram this out. We start out with the same photosensitive silicon slab, which as I said before, does not change quantum sensitivity. When a lower ISO is engaged, the signal is sent through a basic amplifier, which applies an analog gain to the signal before it is sent to the analog to digital converter to convert to digital. Then a digital gain is applied and the signal is recorded onto a codec. When a high ISO is engaged, the signal coming off a sensor instead takes another path through a more powerful amplifier, which is higher gain and additional noise cancellation circuits before going to the ADC, where again, more digital gain is applied and a signal is recorded to media. So what that all boils down to in practice is essentially we get a camera that behaves like two different cameras, depending on our ISO setting. As of this video, I believe Panasonic, Sony, RED, and now Blackmagic are offering cameras with this dual ISO capability. I may have missed a few, but right now I'm just going to focus on the 2018 Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K as an example of how this feature will affect your approach to shooting. Now this is the official dynamic range chart from Blackmagic for the BMP CC 4K. Immediately you should identify three regions. According to Blackmagic literature, the block on the left has a native ISO of 400 and the area to the right has a native ISO of 3200. Now I'm not a big fan of the term native ISO because I think it hides some strategic benefits of ISO. But I, I digress, you'll see more what I mean as we continue on. Notice the area ISO 100 to 1000. It's one solid block rectangle. There is no change in the 13.1 stops of dynamic range here. The camera just slides what is middle gray up and down. This is done by adjusting the gain applied after the ADC or digital gain. On stills cameras, this might be called an ISO invariant range. Now, one caveat with the Blackmagic Cinema camera, if you record raw, this digital gain is recorded only as metadata. If you were to start recording and adjust the ISO inside this range mid recording, you wouldn't actually record any ISO changes. But if you shot ProRes or DNX HR, you would actually see the image brightness shift up and down. The next rectangular area is between ISO 1250 and 6400, this time with 12.3 stops of dynamic range. This represents the new signal path 
and the additional analog gain applied. And then from ISO 8000 on, you see this stair stepping down and we get decreasing dynamic range. I believe at this point, we're just cranking up the analog gain. Let's see how this plays out in real life. I ran the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K for a few days and ran a bunch of tests. Shooting my dynamic range tester, and yes, it has gotten a little out of whack, it needs a tune up, but let's just focus on that bright light on the right, the brightest light there is. At ISO 100, shooting in log, the brightest I can expose this to is around IRE 80. If we consider a middle gray to be around IRE 50, that gives us two stops to work with above middle gray, just as the official Blackmagic Dynamic Range chart shows. Now keep in mind, I cannot expose anything higher than IRE 80. The camera literally clips at IRE 80. Now watch as I step up the ISO. Notice on the vector scope, everything just shifts upward. Even that top right light, the clipping point, the max exposure ceiling. So by the time I'm hitting ISO 1000, now I have five stops of light above IRE 50. Again, my tester needs a tune up, but you get the idea. Five stops of light match up pretty closely with the 5.3 on the official Blackmagic chart. But now watch what happens when we make the leap from 1000 to 1250. It's not a shift up anymore. The two top spots are now hitting the ceiling with the third pretty close to clipping. Again, this was illustrated in the dynamic range chart. Making the leap from 1000 to 1250 immediately chops off about three stops from the top end. But then look at that bottom. Check out that big fat noise line from the ISO 1000 shot and compare that to the much tighter noise floor of the ISO 1250 we gain about 2.5 stops in the darks. Now, I'm showing you log footage because that's, that's the way the camera can visually squeeze 13 stops into what you're seeing now as 8-bit video. Now, this will also apply if you're shooting raw. I said the ISO is only recorded as metadata except when you make this jump between the two different ranges of the dual ISO. Now, if you're not shooting log or raw, then you're not gonna get the full dynamic range of the camera, so the rest of what I have to say may or may not have much mileage. Now, technical tests out of the way, let's talk about how you would best approach shooting with dual ISO. The trick is to know the kind of image you are ultimately trying to produce. For a good way to visualize this, let's bring in Ansel Adams' zone system. We talked about this in my exposure video. Zone five is middle gray. Zones six through 10 are above middle gray with zones zero through four below middle gray. Each zone is one stop higher or lower than the surrounding zones. If your scene is largely in the shadows, that means your shot is mostly below zone five, zones one through three, dark objects with lots of texture in the shadows, you wanna shoot as low an ISO as you can to give yourself as much room as possible for data below middle gray. I'm not talking about underexposing here. You wanna expose middle gray for what middle gray is, but open your exposure as much as you can, that's shutter speed or an aperture, and if you're on a controlled set, add more light, and then shoot at the lowest ISO that you can. If we shot at ISO 100, for example, we would have a whopping 11.1 stops below middle gray to work with. However, dual ISO gives us a second useful option. Take a look at this shot, which I exposed at f2.8, ISO 400, 124th shutter speed. Unfortunately, there's just not enough light in this shot to use any lower ISO than this. At ISO 400, I've got 9.1 stops below middle gray before we get lost in noise. Compare this to ISO 1000 which only has 7.8 stops below middle gray. You can easily see the noise starting to sneak in. But now let's make that dual ISO leap to 1250. And immediately, you see the noise is much less noticeable. I went from 9.1 stops below middle gray at ISO 400 to 7.8 stops below middle gray at ISO 1000, and now 10 stops below middle gray using ISO 1250. That jump from one part of the dual ISO to the other added more shadow detail, 
even with a lesser exposure. Now here's another dark scene example. This time I was able to expose at ISO 100 at f2.8 and a shutter speed of 1 24th of a second. Shooting at ISO 1000 using f2.8 and a shutter of 1 200th of a second, roughly the same exposure, but the higher ISO obviously results in more noise in the shadows. Then if we take one step up from ISO 1000 to ISO 1250, shooting the same f-stop but at, ISO at the 1 250th of a second, the noise floor plunges away. It does literally feel like we're shooting with a brand new camera. The rule applies. In a dark scene, shoot the lowest ISO possible. But with dual ISO, you've got that second much higher baseline to work from. Even if you have a well-lit set, reserve the lower ISOs, the ones starting at 100 and 1250, for scenes that have a lot of shadow in them. The other side of the rule, in scenes where there is a lot of light, and the most important things are gonna be above middle gray, that's zones seven through 10, shoot the highest ISO given your tolerance for digital noise. Again, I did not say overexpose, I said expose properly, but use the highest ISO. And of course, dual ISO puts a caveat in this situation as well. The best demonstration of this is shooting backlit clouds. Clouds, by their very nature, are going to be a stop or so above middle gray, or zone six or zone seven. But backlit clouds are going to be much higher than that. Here's a shot of some backlit clouds I shot at ISO 1000, 1,000th of second shutter speed at f6.2. Now, compare that with this second shot, ISO 125, 1 25th of a shutter speed at f6.2. We dropped down three stops in ISO, but made up with three stops of shutter speed, but now all the detail in our clouds are completely washed away. Now you can see this in the Blackmagic chart. With ISO 1000, we have 5.3 stops above middle gray to work with. But with ISO 125, we're limited to only 2.3 stops. That's not a lot. Now, watch what happens when we step up from ISO 1000 to ISO 1250. The same loss of detail occurs because ISO 1250 only has 2.3 stops above middle gray. So in a bright scene where your focus is on the highlights, shoot the highest ISO that gives you tolerable noise. But when shooting dual ISO, make sure you don't cross over into that next tiered ISO. Now you probably won't be shooting such extreme highlights in everyday normal production. And it's often perfectly acceptable to just let hot spots clip and lose detail. Again, let's look at the Ansel Adams zone system. Three stops above middle gray is zone eight, which Adams identifies as textured snow. With low ISOs on this BMPCC 4K, textured snow runs the risk of being untextured pure white. But if you aren't shooting snow, or in my case, because I live in Southern California, I have to shoot backlit clouds, then you could potentially get away with clipping the highs in everyday shooting. Most of the time, you'll be shooting scenes that are between three or so stops above and below middle gray. Shots like this lake shot, contain both highlights and shadow detail, but nothing too extreme in either direction. Something like this, I may prefer to go with as little noise as possible. So shooting ISO 100 and just live with only two stops above middle gray. After all, the only thing above middle gray is the blue sky, which doesn't have that much detail in it anyway, because there's no clouds. But if you're finding yourself clipping when shooting these outdoor scenes, say you're shooting into the sun, start pushing that ISO higher to give yourself more room in the highlights, at least up until you have to make that switch to the other part of the dual ISO. I hope with our exposure and dynamic range videos that I've given you a perspective on how camera exposure works as a strategy. There is no one size fits all approach. The more you think about how you want that final image to look, or at least the more you think about how you want the camera to best capture the data that you're interested in, the more fine-tuned you can get your exposure practices and the better your final images. But it takes practice, understanding basic principles, and most importantly, getting an intimate feel for how your camera works. The numbers I've, I've stated here are only for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, but every camera has its own personality, even if they are very much similar. 
Now, one last word on dual ISO. It's tempting to look at the strategy and think that all cameras should utilize this technique. But dual ISO isn't the only strategy out there and it certainly won't be the last. Every technique has a trade-off in terms of cost and engineering. As neat as dual ISO is in some ways, it can also tangle people up who don't understand it, which is why I felt it important to put this video together to explain this interesting quirk in the way the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera handles dynamic range. If you like this video, throw us a like, subscribe, and consider becoming a patron on Patreon, as every little bit does indeed help. Thanks to our A-list patrons, you guys rock. Don't forget to check out our merch store. New designs coming very soon, I promise. If you didn't like this video, then I can't think of a better insult than to buy a pallet of premium cotton tees for a sacrificial bonfire to your pagan gods who reside in the shadows and spew digital noise for all of us to capture. Ew. Until next time, my friends, go out there and make a great exposure. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at FilmmakerIQ.com.